Yeah. And that's what I mean by erotic charge. It's the sense that it's not just, you know, when you're having sex. Mm -hmm. That's a that it's not. It's like when you're doing the dishes. Mm -hmm. And yet there's this little sense there that any moment you could just fall into each other's arms and you just don't happen to be doing that at the moment, you know, <laughs> but the, the the attraction is there. It's almost palpable. <laughs> To Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I am your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Hello, Judy. Hello, listeners. Our topic for today is... Plugging in the erotic charge. Ooh, is mm. that feeling a little bit, shall we say, warm, verging on hot? I think it is. We hope so. So <laughs> stay tuned, uh, and we'll be talking about that in a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, before we do that, of course, we want to invite all of you to rate us and subscribe to us and, and review us and all that kind of stuff. And just plain old tell your friends about this podcast. Share the spread the word. Um, like, indeed. follow, rate us, five stars, of course. All of the above. And the, you can find us at CTIN7, that's the number seven, CT for Couples Therapy, CTIN7.com. And when you go to CTIN7.com, you can have access to all of our episodes, uh, wherever it is that you get them from. Uh, you can see them all there, and um, we want you to let other folks know about that. And also, while we're at it, we want to put in a plug, speaking of plugging in the erotic charge, <laughs> we want to put in a plug for the book that came out a couple of years ago that really started this podcast, mm -hmm. and that is... Speaking of plugging, Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. And I'm realizing this uh, topic, actually, there's a couple of different chapters in that particular book that, that bear rather nicely on this topic. Um, we'll be talking about some of that in mm -hmm. a little while. So please do that. It's a, that book is available uh, anywhere books are sold. And uh, if you go to the Amazon site, you can also get the Audible version uh, where I did the uh, narration uh, that has proven to be one of the more popular, popular formats. Um, I will also put in a little, um, little advance notice about another book of mine that is currently in the process of being edited. Uh, so that'll be coming out. Watch for that. Watch this space. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking about that probably in a few months, I imagine. It'll actually be in existence. So let us get into our topic. Yes, on to our topic, plugging in the erotic charge. Yeah. Yes. Now, why are we talking about this today? Well, a couple of things. One thing, we got a letter about it. Uh, but of course, it also, not surprisingly, we got a letter about it also, it comes up a lot in mm -hmm. my conversations with couples. Well, why don't we start by defining erotic charge? Yeah, which isn't so simple to do, is mm -hmm. it? I mean, that word erotic, mm -hmm. it's an exciting word right, for a lot of right. people. Because it sounds... It, it, thinks, it conjures up sex, sexuality. Exactly. Uh, you know, from the, the Greek eros, referring to a particular kind of love. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert that could go into all the differences among agape and eros and whatever the other ones are. Well, that's, that's more than I <laughs> <laughs> there, there are folks who could do that. Uh, but no, eros having to do with that sense right. of it certainly is related to sexuality. But it's not just sex. And I'll tell you how this particular issue happened to emerge in conversation uh, and uh, with, oh, three or four different couples in mm. the past couple of weeks. Wow. So it's, yeah, I mean, it, and it's, that's frequent. It's yeah, not unusual. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, what is synecdoche? Is that it when like things are in the atmosphere? I don't, I don't is recall. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, but whatever. Synchronicity? <laughs> synchronicity. Yeah, I think synchronicity, synchronicity yeah, okay. I think is what you're thinking of. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's always been around. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I'll tell you how it's come up, though, in some of these conversations, which I, I found really interesting. So um, it's come up in situations where, for example, um, oh, just recently I was talking with a couple and they were describing, um, they, they've been together quite a while and they've... Um, you know, they, they get along fine, mm -hmm. but there's this sense there that they're wishing that they could connect more like they used to early on in their relationship. And this particular story, one of the people told was they were both in the kitchen 
and they kind of um, had occasion to bump into each other. We can relate to that. We certainly can. <laughs> well, our kitchen is <laughs> small it, kitchen. It's not large. <laughs> I mean, it's not tiny, but yeah. We, so we, you know, and, and it was interesting because what she was saying, the woman was, uh, it's a heterosexual couple. The woman was saying that she just felt bad because when they would sort of like happen to bump into each other, at one time he would have, and it was always interesting when uh, the way women will describe this. At one time, he would have patted her rear end, mm-hmm. and she misses that. Mm-hmm. Now, I what's interesting, and of course, we talked about this in the session too. I've talked with so many couples where the woman is saying, "He grabs." I might as well be graphic in the language. He grabs my ass, and I can't stand it. Uh. <laughs> and it's he thinks that's somehow supposed to be inviting, and it's not. But she was she was saying kind of the opposite. Actually, this particular woman was saying, "Yeah." When he would go for the upper regions, she was yeah. she was fairly delicate in how she talked about it. Uh-huh. You know, when he would grab at her breasts, yeah, she didn't like that. Yeah. That just felt gross. Yeah. You know, it felt um, like no, that I'm not there yeah, <laughs> at this the moment. Pat on the bottom, but the little pat on the bottom yeah. just felt this loving kind of sense of ooh, you're desirable. Yeah, and that's what I mean by erotic charge. It's the sense that it's not just you know when you're having sex. Mm-hmm. That's a that it's not. It's like when you're doing the dishes. Mm-hmm. And yet there's this little sense there that any moment you could just fall into each other's arms and you just don't happen to be doing that at the moment, you know, <laughs> but the, the the attraction is there. It's almost palpable. Mm-hmm. And when a couple is feeling that and certainly early on and couples will tell me this all the time, right? Early on in their relationship, they will say, well, yeah, that's what it was like. We couldn't keep our hands off each other. Mm-hmm. And then as life goes on, they right. will often say. It's kind of gone by the wayside. It's, it sort of goes by the wayside. And, you know, here, if, if this is another one that if, if I wanted to be impressive, I could memorize the names of these particular hormones and sound like I know what I'm talking about, uh-huh. you know. But what I remember reading about, the hormones involved in infatuation early are not the same hormones that are involved in long-term companionate love. Mm-hmm. But they can be every bit as passionate, mm-hmm. even though they are not the same ones. Right. And so what people talk about is <clears throat> they lose that initial sense of, oh, we just can't keep our hands off each other. And then it gets to the point where it just seems, I've had so many couples tell me, it's just awkward. We don't know how to connect with each other. We're yeah. good roommates. Yeah, yeah. But we don't really know how to do it. And it was just interesting to hear that, that one particular person saying, she just felt bad that there in that moment she was remembering what that's like that you know they weren't they didn't plan to bump into each other in the kitchen they were each doing what they were doing to make dinner or whatever it was mm-hmm. and but it was like a missed opportunity well did it occur to her to pat him on the bottom well what an interesting question <laughs> you know it, it can go both ways it too it can and that is a fascinating <laughs> glad you had, glad you asked that because that's a fascinating question because Another theme I will often hear when it comes to the whole erotic charge thing Mm -hmm. is there is a piece of this that at least stereotypically is gendered in a particular direction. Now, I want to say this carefully because there's zillions of exceptions to this. This is not a hard and fast rule. Right. But often I will hear the woman of a heterosexual couple who is saying she wants to be the one who is approached Mm -hmm. more than she wants to be the one doing the approaching. Mm -hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with the other way around, but that it's the lack of that that feels so difficult. Yeah. So, you know, I get the sense. Well, yes, she wants to feel desired. Exactly. She wants to feel desired. Look, speaking as a man, I think we do too. Mm -hmm. Men, we want to feel desired too. But there is an element of it for women, I I hear from women, (laughs) not to mansplain to you, um, but there's an element of it that seems to me as a man, it seems different. You know, it's yeah. like, well, I can speak to it. So what's your, how do you experience that? Uh, well, I can't, I can't speak to it because, you know, you and I have a church, church <laughs> relationship. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I, I think that I'm very affectionate and loving toward you in, you know, in the kitchen or <laughs> <laughs> you are yes and you know, i like to think i, I am you know too. i yeah. think you know we both have a lot of physicality toward each other and show it in a lot of ways that you know not i'm not saying in the bedroom but like bumping into each other in the kitchen or just walking you know we'll pat the other one or you know touch the other one in a certain way that's very you know romantic it's, and loving and nice and, it's charged yes yeah. it's charged and so you know, I, so i like i like doing that to you because um 
practice because I do. <laughs> you you do, and it, so here's a here's a, a hypothesis to try on, and tell me if this okay. sounds right to you. Because I'm and, yeah, I'm applying this to what I've heard, you know, from all these other couples. Yeah. So in that sense, that you you know you like yeah you like patting me, you know, mm -hmm. and you're 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 not inhibited from doing that, you right. know. I think perhaps mm -hmm. an aspect of that for you is that you feel desired too. I do. Yeah, and I, I believe you do. And are we doing a little TMI here? I don't think so, folks. <laughs> here we are. We're we're living we're so. living what we're talking about yes, here. Yes, yes. But the point is, I think there's an element of that form of uh, just to use a, a probably overbroad term, femininity. Mm -hmm. You hear the little double entendre there, overbroad term. Never mind. That's anything. Yeah, anytime. I, I, I did miss that one, so thank you for pointing it out. Sometimes yeah. I do need to be hit over the head with a mallet. Yeah, and it, it wasn't very good either. But I, I, I do have to acknowledge, anytime you talk about sex, everything is a double entendre exactly. immediately. You know, it's just amazing. Anyway, no, it's, it's the fact that that aspect of femininity mm -hmm. that would say, you know, that women want to feel desired in ways, I say, I think men do too, but there's this particular aspect to women's sexuality often, heterosexual women's sexuality, I don't know how, how much to qualify it, that if if you didn't feel desired, I don't think you'd be inclined to approach me that way. Probably not. And I think that's what I was hearing from, I've heard from bunches of other women, you know, that mm -hmm. sense of, yeah, women want to feel desired, and that's what will spark a woman to also be the, the initiator. Mm -hmm. And I've heard from so many men, why do I always have to initiate? Mm. And then the man will get frustrated feeling, well, she doesn't really want me. Uh -huh. And so it'll, they'll be in this sort of standoff. And you know, neither one will do anything because they're offended by the fact that the other one isn't doing anything, mm -hmm. even though both of them would actually want it. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe if she had, you know, patted him on the butt out of the blue, <laughs> she might have felt, uh, I don't know, or afraid that he was going to give her a look. Well, say, exactly. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? well, it, very much. <laughs> it just seems so out of character. It's like, huh. That is precisely what I've heard oh, from lots he, of folks. Although he could have had a totally opposite reaction and said, ooh. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know... To prescribe, well, try that mm -hmm. by itself, I don't think really addresses it. You have to recognize that the way they got to feel the way they feel is valid. <clears throat> you know, it's meaningful. It's meaningful. Yeah. You know, not that they should stay stuck there, but that it's, you know, this is one of those situations where I'm always telling people, well, look, neither one of you is nuts. You got to be the way you are mm -hmm. for valid and understandable reasons. It's like, yeah, that this has been your experiences. It feels so scary to actually approach the other person in that way or raise anything in that way that you just end up feeling sort of stuck. Mm -hmm. And and therefore you don't do it. And right? therefore you don't do it because, you know, that, that worry is understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I wonder, I'm just thinking of the letter we have, mm -hmm. the listener letter we have, which is so directly related to what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. I wonder maybe we should oh, why don't we read segue that? to that. Sure, okay. go for it. So we got this letter from Annie, and she writes, Dear Bruce and Judy, I'm a 55-year-old woman married to Mitch for 30 years. We have a good, solid marriage, two grown children, satisfying jobs, and a lot in common. The one place where things aren't going so well is in the bedroom. I've been hearing and reading about how some people have something hot and exciting in their sex life, and I just don't think our sex life has it. Like a lot of things in life, our sex life seems to have become a routine. We still have sex about once a week, and it's usually the same thing. Maybe some positions change, but not much else. I find it somewhat satisfying, but not wow. I think I want the wow. I'd like to talk to Mitch about it, but I don't want to offend him or want him to think he's an inadequate lover. How do I broach the subject without hurting his feelings? Mm, yeah. What an interesting question. You know, it's funny, as as a man, mm -hmm. <laughs> me being the man in the conversation, mm -hmm. my first reaction in thinking that is, isn't she nice yeah. to be so caring mm -hmm. that she doesn't want to hurt his feelings? I just <laughs> yes. think that's lovely. That is very nice. You know, because she's not angry. She's not, she's not saying, Oh, he's terrible. Or I'm considering, I want to dump him and mm -hmm. find some guy that could really please me. Right. She just wants to spice things up. Yeah. She wants, she wants the wow. Yeah. And it's sort of, it's, it's kind of funny because that the line there about, you know, I don't want to offend him or want him to think he's an inadequate lover. Yeah. This is one of those situations. Maybe I do this too much with people in sessions. I don't know. I just love to de detoxify 
the stuff that looks toxic, uh -huh. you know? Well, maybe he, the reason you're feeling he's an inadequate lover is that he's an inadequate lover. <laughs> you know? Well, now, that's it, a pretty global, nasty statement. Yeah, but she, you know, she's got a she's got some uh, skin in the game too. Oh, of course, you know. <laughs> <Literally>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. No, and and uh, exactly. But yeah. I, I just want to say, you know, that idea that says, well, yeah, in in the funny way, they're both inadequate lovers, right? Which is to say, they're not getting the wow, and they'd like to have it, and she's wondering. Of, of course, she's wondering, you know, I've heard this is possible and I, I'd like to feel it, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So they're starting, seems to me they're starting from a great place in the sense of she's, she obviously loves, she didn't say it in so many words, but she implies she loves her husband. Right. Implies she feels loved by her husband. Mm -hmm. And she's, <laughs> she's heterosexual, you know, mm -hmm. she's interested in sex with a man. Right. And, in particular with her husband. So, you know, the, and, and she's not saying, oh, the problem is that, you know, one or the other of us has had sexual trauma and so we freak out, you know, mm -hmm. nothing like that, but, which is all, all great, you know. So this is one of those things where <laughs> one of my thoughts is, hey, have you looked in the chapter in my book, Reigniting the Spark, called Sex, Good Sex, and Sacred Sex? Uh -huh. Because that's a, a little shameless plug there, speaking of, of plugging in. Um, there's I, I do talk about that in there, but mm -hmm. we can we can talk a little bit about that now. Mm -hmm. One of the things I would be thinking in, in a conversation with this woman, of course, if I were doing it, I would want them both there. Sure. You know? um, but one of the things I'd be thinking with each of them is to what extent do they know about their own sexual responses? Mm -hmm. um, you know, have they spent some time with themselves? Right. In, in addition to with each other. And there are lots of people, lots of, and look, let me put on the table here. I am not a sex therapist. That mm -hmm. is not my training or. No, you know, and neither right. am I. But we have yeah. interviewed quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've interviewed quite a few. Right? It's sort of like, you know, I'm not a rabbi, but I play one on television. Right. <laughs> but no, but but I, uh, obviously sex comes <clears throat> up a lot in conversations in couples therapy. Oh, yeah, of course absolutely. it does. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say, but see, that's the thing. A sex therapist is when you're having problems. I mean, I invite sex therapists to beg to differ with what I'm just saying here. Yeah, well, she is having a problem. She's having a problem, but she's not having a sexual dysfunction. Right. She's just wanting it to be better. Right. Which is not the same thing as saying, oh, what's the problem because I have all this pain right, pain with intercourse or, 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 I, or I don't want it or, or, or no I'm libido, traumatized or, yes. or any of right. those sorts of things. So. She needs to explore what it is that gives her her own wow mm -hmm. and be able to share that with him. Now, of course, her her question as she framed it is, how do I broach this subject without hurting his feelings? A wonderful question. And the answer is, I don't know. You broach the subject and you risk hurting his feelings. Right. Well, now, like you always say, you have to be able to tolerate the anxiety in order to have intimacy. You must have read my book. I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> several times. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And we've, and we've talked about it and in this podcast. And we have talked about it, yes. But that that is, uh, I, I'm going to say that that is what she's facing here. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly what she's facing is is tolerating the anxiety to achieve the intimacy in yeah. this situation. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because, again, her, her not wanting to hurt his feelings is, is lovely. I mean, again, I, you know, I don't tell people, oh, never mind, go ahead and insult someone. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not it. But to be able to raise a subject that you know is going to raise anxiety but be willing to do so is a nice thing. Now, it occurs to me, again, as from my male side here, it occurs to me to think, you know, if you were going to broach such a subject with me, mm -hmm. if you were broaching it along the lines of, I've heard about some really cool possibilities sexually, and I don't know much about it, but I think we ought to find out together because I think it could really add a wow to our, our sex life. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would be hurt by that. I think I'd be greatly intrigued. Mm. You know? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? In other words, it, it's more of like a an invitation to a shared experience uh -huh. than it is an accusation that... Hey, right. you know, you're not very good at this, mm -hmm. you know? Right. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts? I, I think yeah. that's a good idea. I think if um, she wants to approach it with him, she could, like you just said, try things or maybe even get a book that says, uh, you know, on, on either your book or <laughs> some of the other books of guests that we've had on the show. Um what was it? Sex Points was one. Yeah, and Sex and... Points, that's Batsheva Marcus's book. I will note that one is especially when you're dealing with problems. She yeah. is a sex therapist, and 
works a lot with most uh, generally women where they're having difficulties. And she's all about in that book, she's all about a variety of different ways to approach difficulties so that they can add up to, you know, right. To and among fine. them, you know, masturbating, using mm-hmm. toys, game playing, role fantasizing. playing, fantasizing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. All different types of things too would do. And there was another book, I forgot the name. Anyway, it's escaping me. Yeah. Um, but again, is ha- having resources available that you could share with your partner, say, how would you feel about trying this or mm-hmm. how how or you know maybe let's let's go to a bar and pick me up you mm-hmm. know like role playing types of things mm-hmm. that you know you, you don't let's not go together i'll go there i'll sit you come in you know we try a little thing and <laughs> in that context i want to mention something that i've i've often uh shared with folks um, it's been years since I read about this research. So, you know, <laughs> apologies to people doing the research if I'm misstating any of it. But there's been research done. Uh, some of it, uh, we're, in, we're recording this in Vermont, and some of it, this, this research was actually done at the University of Vermont. And by women researchers, which I think is a, an important point to note, because this is not, you know, men making assumptions about women. It's, it's, <laughs> it's women studying this, too. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's an yeah, important point. Yeah, it does point. make a difference. Yeah. And one of the things they, uh, one of the um, areas that I remember reading about is, and there's actually, I remember years ago reading a book by Pepper Schwartz about this uh, issue as well. She's a, uh, I think she's a a psychologist or sociologist or something like that. Anyway, she shows up on some of the reality TV Mm. shows as as one of the experts. Name is familiar. Yeah. Um, But in any case, the, what they were studying was couples you know, if you look at married couples, heterosexual married couples, and what you find is they have varying degrees to which they are governed by kind of standard gender assumptions. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the couples where the men do the men's stuff and the women do the women's stuff. And, you know, then there are couples that strive to be egalitarian. It doesn't mean everybody does the same thing. It does mean that they they strive to not let the standard gender assumptions be what defines what they do. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the, and there's kind of a continuum of couples if you look at that. So what I'm remembering from reading about this research is the couples that had rigid gender roles. You know, in, at least in in the the culture being studied, which is sort of you know what what is uh, referred to as weird cultures, Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. You know, mm-hmm. the, the weird cultures. They, that's us. That's us. <laughs> yeah, that is us. The in in our culture, um, the couples with rigid gender roles, the women were often just pissed off. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it was it felt oppressive. The men were upset because the women were pissed off. <laughs> you know, it it wasn't working well, and that didn't work well in any of the domains of their life. Uh, be it you know just how they got along on day to day, and their sex lives weren't great either because everybody was pissed off. So it wasn't working very well. <laughs> the couples that strove for a you know, as much as possible for egalitarian or just to not be governed by the assumptions reported being far less pissed off. Mm -hmm. They got along better. Mm -hmm. Uh, Things generally went well. There was one little problem. (laughs) Guess what? In the context of what we're talking about. And their sex life. Their sex lives were boring. It it could have been written by Annie. It could have been. Yeah. And what the researchers found that I just found rather intriguing they said there was a subset of the folks who were like the, the mega egalitarian types. Mm-hmm. There was a, a subset of them that actually would say, well, you know, actually our sex lives are pretty good. And they would, uh, you know, this, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm editorializing slightly by saying this or dram- dramatizing slightly, but they would sheepishly report to the researchers, well, yeah, our sex lives are really good because we play games in the bedroom. Mm-hmm. And the games they played were power games. Uh-huh. They would be games in which somebody wasn't, you know, the, where somebody was in charge and, you know, somebody was more dominant and the other was more submissive. Now, not not all the way to like extreme dominant submission type mm-hmm. things that sometimes people are into. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's interesting. And, and they might reverse roles sometimes. Yeah. So you never knew who was going to be, you know, the one calling the shots, so mm-hmm. to speak. But that idea that somebody wanted, you know, sometimes to be sort of you know, not against their will, but taken, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And that this, you'd especially hear this from women mm-hmm. there, you know, women, uh, the, some of the same research was talking about, uh, sexual fantasies 
and women's sexual fantasies, heterosexual women's sexual fantasies, include things like that sure sound like rape an awful lot of the time, even though I have never met a woman who actually wanted to be raped. I mm -hmm. mean, maybe they exist, but I have not met such people. But it wasn't the it wasn't the actual, you know, horrible violation they were looking for. Right. But what they were looking for was the sense of being so desirable that the guy couldn't resist taking her for his pleasure. Mm. And that felt like a turn on to a lot of the women. Mm -hmm. And so in, in an egalitarian lifestyle, they're sharing power. Yeah. Which, again, helps them get along, yeah. you know, and especially in a, in a culture which now, you know, for the last, well, I guess say I'd say less than our lifetimes, because I'm remembering when little girls didn't have the didn't think of the options that little boys thought of. But that's yeah, changed. Certainly. A lot. And, you know, it sounds also like Annie and Mitch here, you know, they're they're doing the same thing they were doing for 30 years you know you're not the same people you were 30 years ago yeah. so there's no reason why your sex life has to be the same as it was 30 years ago yeah and you know and you mentioned that and i think it's interesting because this this reminds me of uh, the david schnarch uh, thing that i'll often mention david schnarch he died a couple of years ago uh too young if you ask me i think he was in his early 70s um anyway he was a, a couples therapist again not a sex therapist per se but a couples therapist mm -hmm. who wrote a lot about sex mm -hmm. and in uh, couples and he would uh when he would lecture to fo you know to audiences about his work he would ask people okay at what age do you think men and women respectively reach their sexual peak mm -hmm. you remember this you probably mm -hmm. remember yeah, this story yeah. so the stereotypical answers he would get would be well what would what would you think well like men in their like 20s and women around 40 yeah exactly it did, whatever it was it was always women older than men right and he would say no 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 i beg to differ actually both men and women reach their sexual peak in their 60s and 70s mm -hmm. and of course would get the sort of what do you mean yeah, <laughs> From, yeah. because and it's kind of related to what you're saying about annie and mitch they're you know she's 55 she didn't say how old he is but presumably similar age. they've been married yeah. 30 years and um it's it's interesting because it's like, come on, you're not capable at 55 of the, of what I sometimes refer to as sexual gymnastics. Mm -hmm. People are capable of in their 20s, but or or you know like for men in terms of how many orgasms it, you know unless you learn to have non ejaculatory orgasms, which is another topic we won't cover today. <laughs> but you know like mm -hmm. how many times can you come in the course of a a given 24 hour period right. it, that number gets chances are smaller. it's not going to be like when he was 18 <laughs> exactly exactly so the obviously schnarch was not talking about that right what he was referring to was maturity sure the ability to tolerate and this is a some of my my shtick about tolerating uh anxiety for intimacy i really got from schnarch's work and mm -hmm. he's he was a bowenian for those of you who know about bowen family systems i am not an orthodox anything certainly not an orthodox bowenian but i did learn a lot from them mm -hmm. um and he talks a lot about that that that's what you need to have the kind of desire that makes for that wow factor that Annie is looking for you need maturity right and indeed, to be able to broach the subject with your partner, realizing, you know, I don't know how you're going to take this. And I, I you know, I don't want to say, oh, we our, our sex life is horrible because mm -hmm. she's not saying that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to raise the issue that says, I think we can we can get more of a wow here. That's a little scary. Yeah. And that requires maturity to be able to say, yeah, I'm willing to take that risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And look, we don't know about Mitch. I mean, her her implications are that he's a nice guy. You know, right. she sounds like a nice guy, and she sounds like want a to nice offend guy. Him, she doesn't want to hurt his feelings. I'm sure he's you know very cognizant of her feelings. Well, too. we we hope that's true. I will note, however, that there are a lot of us of the male persuasion. Mm -hmm. um, those of us, I sometimes like to say, those of us who have defective second X chromosomes, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> <laughs> which which I think is actually there's some physiological, you know, it's a little silly way of saying it. But yeah, because the Y chromosome is basically just a stub of an X chromosome. Mm -hmm. It's just the X chromosome missing a chunk of it. I think that's true. I invite uh, I invite the, um, the geneticists and biologists in the in, among our audience to correct me on that. <laughs> but in any case, that those of us who are male do tend on occasion to take offense mm -hmm. if a woman says, hey, not so fast, or hey, not there, but here, or you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it will, it's that same, um, 
it's enacting the same bit about, well, wait a minute, if you want me to be in charge, then don't tell me how to do it. Yeah. And that, of course, tends to be awful in terms of encouraging people to be able to communicate freely and say mm-hmm. what they like or don't like. And, you know, when I what I often say to men is when she says, hey, not like that. Yeah. If you hear that as as an insult, that's <laughs> you're setting up a death spiral. Mm-hmm. If you hear that as a gift, it's like, dude, she's giving you a gift. She's she's giving you her user's guide. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like. She's telling you how to make her be delighted by what you do. That's what right. an amazing well, gift. <laughs> you know? well, men don't like reading the manual. We know no, that. <laughs> I know. It, 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 that's why I use that example. You know, men don't like reading the manual. Men don't like asking for directions. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But for this to work, the guy's going to have to figure out. He's going to have to uh, listen to the uh, manual. <laughs> yeah. And take it as the, the, that's the part that if he can, if he can see it as a gift mm-hmm. rather than seeing it as a criticism. Right. It's like, wow. You know, that's what I was thinking. And you know, when I was imagining how might Annie approach him about any of this, mm-hmm. it's like, hey, I've got something that I think might be really exciting here. I'm a little scared to talk about it because, you know, it's it involves our kind of looking at what we've been doing with a, a bit of a critical eye. Mm-hmm. But I think it's really exciting. You know, what do you think? You know, yeah. if he can get excited by that, then they're then they're all off and running. You know, then mm-hmm. they're into exploration and learning and play, and that's fun. And getting back to our erotic charge, you know that that term, that's what gives you the erotic charge. You start becoming aware of that underlying excitement. Even you know, way in between sexual encounters. Right, right, and and like I said, it could just be a little rub on the back or on the bottom while you're in the kitchen or out for a walk or going for a drive, taking your partner's hand or squeezing his thigh or mm-hmm. just little, little gestures. It's all of those related to touch. Yeah, and then there's all the nonverbal and non-physical ones. That's true. The, where it it's like a a, it's a it's a look. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's a. It's a recognizing a double entendre, look, you know. Love, love. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, I better not sing too much. We'll have to pay royalties here. <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah. Was that little enough? We don't have to pay royalties so. for that song. Yes. No, it, it, that's it. But yeah. that's what that's about. Yeah, yeah. It's that sense of, you know, it's always sitting there and it's really nice that it's sitting there. Mm-hmm. And again, here I, I have to invoke the fact, you know, couples therapist, what are the problems I see around that? Mm -hmm. What I will often see, and it's really painful, what I will often see is people who get into this um, kind of standoff again, where it's not that neither one wants to approach the other for sex. It's that usually the man, not always, but usually the man is feeling like, why don't you want any, you know, what I want from you is that you show me that kind of physical, you know, Sex, but not just sex. You know, mm-hmm. the guy will often say it's not just about the sex because I and I believe him. It's often not just about the sex, but the woman will be saying all you want is sex from me. Yeah, that it invalidates everything else, mm-hmm. and a lot of it is because that erotic charge becomes dangerous in that standoff. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? They can't let themselves feel that sort of you know twinkle in the eye, double entendre stuff. Yeah, because it starts to feel dangerous. Yeah, and that's that is a difficult set of issues. I don't want to um, sugarcoat that. Uh, but, you know, the the way out, well, that's what I work with with folks a lot. The way out of that involves quite a bit of anxiety mm-hmm. because it does involve questioning a lot of your assumptions and, you know, kind of loosening the categories a bit rather than just, you know, for the woman, it's like, you know, and it's funny because usually the women in this situation will, will recognize his interest in her sexually isn't a bad thing for their relationship. This mm-hmm. is not a woman who's saying, no, I don't want sex. Right. She just wants it to be better. She Well, she, not better even, but wow. you know, Annie <laughs> wants the wow. But you know, I'm talking about couples where they're in uh-huh. this kind of yeah. awful standoff where it just keeps, you know, every time they're in their presence, the yeah. tension level is really awful yeah. because they're right. just both worried about how do we possibly connect here. Mm-hmm. That is a, a tricky, as I say, it involves a lot of anxiety for both parties. For the guy, it's like, you know, he ends up feeling like nothing I do is right, no mm-hmm. matter what I do. Sure. And of course, that's that thought itself becomes toxic. So it is difficult stuff. Anyway, I, I hope we've um, 
<laughs> well, actually, what do we tell Annie? It's basically, hey, Annie, risk it. There's a short answer. That's, well, yes, that's, that's what I think uh, our long answer is what we've just talked about. <laughs> and the short answer is, yeah, go for it. Yeah. 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 You know, fi find a book, find a video, something that, that you can bring with you that might support what it is that you're saying and, and helping you articulate what it is that you want and maybe giving you some of the language that you need to broach this because mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like you you don't know how to do it. So I would say look into some books. Um, of course, Reigniting the Spark is a really good one. Like Bruce said, his chapter on sex, good sex, and sacred sex. And like we mentioned, Batsheva's book. And But there are others that it, oh, I can never design. remember names of anything. And so just, I apologize sure, to some there's of lots the authors of... that we've had on. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, you can check some of our old podcast episodes, uh, for people that we've had on with interviews, but anyway, you know what we're talking about and you can figure it out. So, uh, something that you want to bring to Mitch that, um, says that, you know, you'd like to spice things up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of an invitation as opposed to a criticism. Right. Yeah, well, you know, like don't show up one night in, in a see-through nightie with a dildo in your hand saying, <laughs> or, or maybe you should, well, I was, hello, I was say, lover. <laughs> You know, I, I'm imagining in Mitch's situation, depending on the guy, that yeah, might yeah, be, he, that, that whoa, could be. who are you? And this is kind of cool. <laughs> so actually, may, that could maybe be that way. is, maybe that is. <laughs> Which, uh, depends on Annie, depends on Mitch, right? There so you go. That, that, there's a way. Yes. So whatever works for you and is comfortable for you, Annie. So I hope that helps. And uh, to our other listeners, if you'd like to find ways of plugging in your erotic charge, <laughs> or if you have other questions and topics that you would like me and Bruce to talk about on the air, you can email us. You can email Bruce, bruce at ctin7.com, or me, judy, at ctin7.com, or just visit our website, ctin7.com. And when you visit our website, which is being worked on as we speak, by mm -hmm. the way, that's probably, if you're hearing this soon after our recording, recording it. It's still the old website, but sometime in the next uh, couple of months, we're going to have a brand spanking new website that'll be lots nazier and more mm -hmm. professional. Uh, when you go there, you will see there's an actually, there's a way you can actually sign up to be interviewed yourself. Uh, you can also, of course, by email, just suggest uh, other folks to be interviewed. We've got all sorts of interesting guests lined up. We um, do. We, uh, well, we almost had one today, but he came down with COVID. She, she, it was, she, she, oh, she, she came, came down with COVID. It was COVID. a couple. Yeah, it was a couple. Yeah, yeah so, she came uh, down with yes, COVID. So, so that, we'll that, have them on at a future date. We will indeed. So um, let's put in another plug just for you to all subscribe and rate and review and all that kind of stuff. Tell your friends about our podcast. And also tell your friends about my book, Reigniting the Spark. Uh, and when you do that, um, if you re put a review in for that, especially on the Amazon site, I almost say that a bit sheepishly. It's like, yeah, bummer, but that's yeah, where I you, know not everybody. That's where likes you need to that, do it. <laughs> but you know, that's where everybody goes. That's where everybody. Most goes. people. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how people find books <laughs> right. overwhelmingly uh, these days. Yeah. So uh, yeah, please do that. And, and did uh, we mention that there's an audio book and a Kindle book? We did. Well, we mentioned the audio book earlier and mentioned oh, okay. it again. Yes, <laughs> that I did the narration for the audio book. Yeah, you can also get it for Kindle as mm -hmm. well. And there's another book coming. Watch for my uh, forthcoming book, but I won't talk more about that now. But, you know, be be aware. It's in the pipeline. And so, until next time. Remember, be kind. Don't panic. And have faith. Mm -hmm.